call the January 6, 2021 City Council meeting to order. First up, we'll have Commissioner Smith give us the prayer. Then we'll have Mark Creaser and our color guard do the presentation of colors and then the pledge. Let's soon add to the prayer. Our Father, our God, we come now and say thank you, Lord, for allowing us to see this day, for how you have protected us through 2020 and brought us to a brand new year, 2021. We thank you, Father, for your blessing. That's my Lord, to continue to bless this council. Our mayor to continue to lead us and guide us and direct us in the way that you have us to go. We ask us, Father, you bless upon every individual that's in this chamber that we feel your presence. We give you the blessing and the glory. allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our fact for today, on January 6, 1838, Samuel Morse demonstrates the telegraph system for the first time in Morristown, New Jersey. The telegraph used electric impulse to transmit encoded messages over a wire. This technology revolutionized the long distance communication. A series of dots and dashes were used to represent letters and numbers known as the Morse code. In 1843, Samuel Morse convinced Congress to fund construction of the first telegraph line from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore. And in 1844, he sent the first official telegraph with the message, What Have God Wrought? Eventually, telegraph lines were set up across the country as well as the world, and it reaches height and popularity in the 1920s and 30s. One of the most widely used known telegraph companies established in 1851 was the New York and Mississippi Valley Printing Telegraph Company, which later changed its name to Western Union. Telegraph companies changed the world, which meant most telegraphs, telegrams was sufficient and to the point. Over the course of time, telegraph messages were replaced by cheaper and more efficient communication services such as long-distance phone lines, faxes, and emails. The last telegram delivered by Western Union was in January of 2006. Back to the day. Thank you, Commissioner Smith. <clears throat> Okay, approval of the minutes. Anybody have any changes, additions, subtractions? If not, look for a motion to approve. So move. Got a motion by Commissioner Langson. Second. Second by Commissioner Becker. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Edward, any changes to the agenda? There are no changes to the agenda, Mayor. Okay, first up, um, our good friend, Representative Keith Trunow. Um, gosh, this is kind of refreshing. He reaches out to me several weeks ago I said, hey, I'd love to come, you know, at least introduce myself to the city uh, administration and, and the, the folks here in the good good town of Apopka. And uh, so I said, we'd love to have you. And what's really exciting is not only we're going to have him, his staff here once a month, he's going to come out once a week. So we've got plenty of opportunities. If you've got a state issue uh, that you'll be able to meet uh, Keith's team here in Apopka. Uh, and I think he'll go over that as, as he uh, brings us remarks. So Representative Keith True now. Uh, thank you, your mayor. mayor. Um, um, I look forward. I'm very honored to to be representing District 31 and this piece of Apopka and North 
West Orange County. Um, like you mentioned, um, staff, a, a, a lean guy, our district secretary, and, and Eric Ramundo, legislative aide, will be here once a week. Um, we want to represent for the constituents of, of this area, along with our work that we have to do in Lake County. Um, most of you know me already, but uh, I've been farming and in, in, in business in this area for a very long time. I understand a lot of the issues that um, take place here in Apopka and Zellwood and North Lake County, most of Lake County. Um, I feel like uh, we're going to do some great things. I think that uh, we'll, I'll be a voice in Tallahassee for, for us and uh, make, make Florida better and better for all of us to be here and preserve what we can and, and do the best we can for, uh, for this area. Thank you very much for having me here today. So. Any, any questions for Representative True now? <laughs> no questions, just I look forward to working with you and uh, making sure that Orange County is your primary focus. Not like Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no, but I, I look forward to it and thank you for your service and um, look forward to our partnership. Yeah, we've got, everybody should have in front of you a sheet from Keith True now, you know, committee weeks, um, his two legislative aides, district aide and, and legislative aide, um, and so also the, the times that he'll be, they'll be here in Apopka. So we'll, we'll get that up on, on Facebook as well as our website so that we know that, um, so everybody have an opportunity to come, come meet, meet his team. So we, we appreciate, uh, thank you for reaching out to us. Thank you for being, you know, our representative and, and, uh, Look forward to some great things this year. Yes, Thank you. I, I just want to be the, the accessible representative. Yes. I want to yeah. be the person <laughs> you can come to, and, and these guys are ready and willing to help. So, yeah. Thank Any, you very much. Anybody else? Good just now? ditto. We appreciate yep. appreciate your All service. Right. Uh, it, it's good. It was very nice meeting you, and finally meeting the yes. gentleman behind the big red signs. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. And you got you got uh, Representative Smith on your, your your team because he uh, he likes agriculture. So, <laughs> most definitely. <laughs> oh gosh! All right. Um, next up, we have presentation by Joseph Chrisafoli. He's going to kind of give us a kind of facilities maintenance update. I know some of the things you we've been doing here in the last year, year and a half. You may or may not have seen, but there's been a lot of infrastructure projects going on in Apopka that uh, I thought we should highlight, um, some of which, a lot of which probably should have been done long before Joe got here, and I'm not sure he'd have taken the job if he'd known how bad some of this infrastructure was, but we're glad to have Joe on the team, and uh, he's going to go through some of the things that we've, we've accomplished, and then some of the kind of the immediate needs here in the next, you know, 12 to 18 months we'd like to also accomplish. So, Joe, take it away. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, thank you for uh, allowing me to be here today. Um, yeah, I've only been here about a month, and, 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 and like you said, I, I may have re uh, <laughs> reconsidered, maybe asked for a little bit more money. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, no, facilities maintenance is, is you, know, it's, you know, traditionally in a, you know, many you know, fields and businesses, you know, it's one of those things that's uh, typically you know, uh, uh, not, uh, um, not a lot of thoughts put into it, you know, as, as far especially when it comes to budgeting and things like that. But it's extremely important. A um, little uh, overview on our department. Um, on the top there, uh, uh, we maintain all of the city facilities, um, with the exception of the water uh, water reclamation plants and their, and their lift stations. Um, that's that's something new. Uh, just actually, just a few months ago, that we've uh, taken taking on the maintenance for recreations facilities as well now. So we, we manage and maintain all of the, of the facilities. It's about 55 buildings, roughly 260,000 square feet, um, all the administration, fire department, PD, recreation facilities. Um, the air conditioning union number might be a little bit off because uh, we actually got, uh, got rid of a few of our buildings on our inventory, but um, some are a little bit over 100 uh, units, chiller, boiler, generators, um, 45 fire and security alarm systems, and that's a, pro a work in progress right now, actually. Um, we are the key holder, the responder uh, for all of the facilities 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, between me and, and my staff. Uh, about 650000 in, in operating and in, in capital, 150000 It was actually budgeted for this year, but we rolled over about three ninety from last year. Um, so quite quite a few projects going on. I'm about to show you this in here in a second. Um, we have three, three full-time employees in our department. 
besides myself. I've been here just a little over a month. I started on Cyber Monday, so I did not get to shop on Amazon like everyone else did. Uh, I was busy. So um, I started uh, about a month, little over a month ago now. William uh, has been here 15 years. Almost uh, half of those have been in facilities. Uh, Jose has been here for almost 10 now, and same thing there, about five years in facilities. So we have a uh, I've got really good bones in the department. Um, Jose and William uh, cover a lot of territory, um, as you can see there. Um, last month, we had 73 work orders. Um, we're you know, transitioning to a, a different work order system. We're looking at some other systems right now to kind of track our numbers better. Uh, 73, and December, December is typically a slow month in, in maintenance uh, because of uh, just different, uh, different reasons. But we do PMs uh, monthly, generators, that's 48 generators. So we are working, um, uh, we've got approval to, to, now that we do recreation, that we cover those facilities, uh, pulling over one of their uh, uh, facilities maintenance workers into our department to help us with the work order. Um, and that's pending right now, but we're working on that. So a little quick, hopefully quick, uh, background, some of the things that got done last year uh, in 2020. Uh, roof at uh, Fire Station 3 was completed. There's some before foes. It's a terrible condition in, in the after. Uh, that was about 47000 It's actually a very good price. I'm surprised uh, that it was that low. Um, we did uh, the roof at Public Services, um, and uh, that was just finished up in November for about 86000 um, Terrible, terrible condition. The reason I showed this before is because really a lot of these things, and I'll get into some of those slides here in a minute, but a lot of these, uh, a lot of this maintenance for our facilities, and, and, you, and you're well aware of it, is, is uh, behind. So these roofs probably should have been done five plus years ago, if not even more than that. So those are finally done. Um, some of the other notable projects here in 2020 before I arrived, uh, City Hall Boiler was done. That, again, another, another thing that was probably five to 10, if not more, years behind schedule. Um, very uh, dangerous situation, honestly, uh, and I'm glad it's replaced before I got here. Uh, we also did some of the doors, uh, or the security and handicap accessible doors out front here. Uh, those were finished up last year. So some of the big projects we got in progress uh, that I hit the ground running. Um, we uh, are in the process of replacing the chiller unit here at City Hall. Um, that's uh, about a $129,000 project. Um, that was rolled over from last year's budget. Um, that will also, uh, that'll get us our chiller up to date. Does not address air handlers, and that's a whole different story, but um, that'll get our chiller up to date and uh, also <laughs> upgrade our building automation systems here for, the, uh, for City Hall. Um, Rob's very happy about that because our system is very, very outdated uh, as far as the software is concerned, so we're gonna get that up to date. And it'll allow us to do some, some really neat things with uh, some building uh, automation and information uh, troubleshooting uh, across the city, actually. The system's capable of tying in remote facilities. It's a very nice system. We're very lucky to have it. We'll be upgrading that here uh, in, the, in the next month or so. One of the big ones that everyone knows about, everyone sees it, is the roof here at City Hall. Uh, part of the roof was already done a few years ago. Um, this will be the, basically finishing out the roof at City Hall. It's a big project, um, 6,000 square foot. It's all the shingles, really, on this roof here. Um, and all the gutters, um, cornice, this is hard to see, of course, but um, roof's not in great shape. The cornice, the trim work around this building is in very, very poor shape. It's going to need a lot of attention here. Um, so we'll be uh, tackling that. We actually have a meeting tomorrow with our contractors. We have a list of pre-approved uh, uh, roofing contractors. Uh, they'll be here on site tomorrow to, to do a pre-bid walk and, and assess it and, and start working on quoting that mm -hmm. out and getting that started really, really soon, hopefully. Um, my plan is to have that done before it gets real hot. Um, April uh, is really my target for that. We're also in the process of re, uh, revamping the community center or, or the VFW. Um, we um, are working on the carpet, uh, replacing carpeting in there. Um, some of the lighting, um, th those are all, actually most of the materials have arrived for that. We have that scheduled for the last two weeks of January. Very, very big project. Um, the mayor's very excited about it. We, we are very excited about it. That facility has needed, uh, needed some attention and it'll uh, give us a lot of uh, new opportunities for that, for that facility to, to modernize it. So that's, uh, that will be expected to be completed uh, at the end of the month, um, February 1st, to look a totally different building there. Public Services Administration building is, uh, was damaged back in uh, June from uh, roof damage. That's why that roof was replaced. Uh, as part of that, that roof replacement, um, or due to that roof replacement, the, uh, there was some flooding in that building. The, uh, when I walked in my first day, there were tiles missing in half the building, and I said, what did I get myself into? <laughs> um, this building, it's actually still almost that way now. We uh, are finally getting some, some traction on that and getting this uh, repaired. Um, some ceiling tiles, flooring, the, it was a, it's a pretty big project, so this will be uh, hopefully wrapped up here in the next few months as well. 
One of the big things we're working on also is LED light, lighting retrofits. There's not a lot of money in the budget for these things, but they're very important to me. I'm a, I'm a lighting and a, an energy efficiency guru. Um, I'm really, really excited to have a starting point for this project. Um, in the budget, we have uh, some money available for the fire departments to retrofit their lighting in the engine bays, and hopefully eventually that'll tra transition to other things. Um, but we have already gotten two of the fire stations completed, fire stations two and fire station four. Um, five was already done uh, in LED because it was a new building. But uh, two and four are completed. Uh, fire station three is in progress, and fire department one, uh, fire station one is in, pro uh, in planning right now. We're looking at changing it a little bit to be a little bit more efficient, actually, uh, compared to what we've already done. Uh, so those things are in progress. We're also working on transitioning through, you know, office spaces, city facilities as the money's available or as the need is there. Um, my staff has been directed to, to not uh, spend any money, really, if, if we can avoid it on you know, fluorescent lighting, old, old fixtures, old wiring. We're going to try and take a look at that and kind of take a step back before we spend any money and say what makes sense. It may, need, it may be more money on the front end, but we're really looking at efficiency and considering that in everything we do. Um, that's a really big, uh, important, uh, important uh, thing for me. Um, we are working on standards uh, right now. You, and again, you see it. Uh, we we kind of don't we don't have any standards as far as lighting or construction or design even on our facilities. So that's something we're uh, going to be tackling. Again, I've only been here a month, so I'm sorry we're not <laughs> that far along yet. But we're working on a lot of things. Um, one of the, also, uh, the other things uh, the mayor presented this to me about a month ago. Uh, it's a Duke Energy Rate study. Um, and Duke had presented some information as far as some savings that were that they, they saw. Um, I'm diving deeper into that right now. I actually have another meeting or have a meeting with Duke on Friday to discuss that a uh, little bit more uh, more in depth. But there's some savings right right away that they're showing us uh, between 20 to 50, I believe, was their high number, 20 to 50 thousand dollars a year in savings. Some very easy things to do um, that don't change anything. But basically, it's like your cell phone bill. You know, you look at it, and every once in a while, you can change the plan, and it doesn't change your service. It's kind of what we're doing, what we're looking at with Duke. There's some options and some savings right there that are very easy, low-hanging fruit type of things that we can we can take care of those and and save some money, and then reinvest that in some other things later on. So that's in progress. Door operators, this is a handy the ADA transition plan from back in 2016. Uh, we've been taking a uh, little bit of money each year and adding the handicap accessible doors on on our facilities. And there was a priority list and a, and a, a plan to implement those uh, this year. And actually, in the next, hopefully, in the next month or two, I'll get these purchase orders entered. But we'll um, install uh, handicap accessible door operators on the police department, uh, the Northwest Recreation Facility, um, utility building office, uh, or the annex, um, community center, and Billy Dean Community Center. And there are more to come in future years as well. Um, we actually budgeted forty-one thousand dollars for that. We've found a better way to do it directly with the manufacturer of that hardware. So we're going to save some money, and hopefully we can take the rest of that and incorporate that into more uh, ADA um, accessible features like door hardware and, and line striping and things like that. We're going to be looking at reinvesting that. So some of our, and Edward told me I had five minutes, and I know I'm already over that, so he's probably back here <laughs> ready to hit me. But real quickly, we have some other priorities that have been presented to us that are not necessarily budgeted, but things that we really need to do short term. Um, parking lot here at this facility is one of them. Um, we're working on uh, pinning down some real numbers on this. Uh, we've got some preliminary estimates actually just came in yesterday or late last night uh, for about fifty thousand dollars of upgrades that are needed here uh, to repave part of that part of the parking lot here, the the green section there, and then uh, seal coat to hopefully buy us another five years or so on the rest of these lots. So this is still something we're still working on planning, but just uh, yeah, a heads up that we are working on it. We are aware of it. Um, that's the main thing. So we're working on this one here. This will, again, same thing with, uh, with the ADA striping, we'll get this uh, into compliance. Uh, we, we do have some work to do there. So one of the things the mayor asked me to kind of to bring up, and this is a longer conversation for another time, I'm sure, but um, we've deferred maintenance, and, which everybody does to a degree, but we've deferred a lot of maintenance on a lot of different sy uh, systems and, and facilities here. So I know it's very hard to see up there, but some of the big big ticket items, roofing, air conditioning, um, alarm systems, uh, you know, or, or building safety, uh, life safety systems. Um, because they're big ticket items, they typically get pushed aside or pushed, pushed down, the, down the road. Um, so some of these items here, uh, you know, um, and again, these are, these are priorities based on previous data before, before I've started. So um, roofing projects, you know, we're, we're, we need to get some of these done. And I've got in a future slide here, you'll see where we've actually gotten some of them done already. But, 
um, roofing, sorry, I'm in the back one, yeah, roofing projects, you know, we have about 250,000, give or take, um, in uh, priority, what we call priority one roofing projects that are really should have been done 10 years ago or 15, maybe even 20 years ago. Um, things that really need to be done that are causing problems uh, that would need to be addressed. So things like that, and then we have some other, you know, alarm systems. Most of the alarm system things are at budget this year. That's just a matter of getting them done. So we're gonna focus on those as well. Air conditioning systems are big ticket items, and we have we are very, very, very behind in those uh, on those systems. Uh, we actually have units um, that are older than me, um, <laughs> and probably older than about half the people in this room. Um, they uh, we have systems that are that are thirty, almost forty years old in some cases, uh, which is just absolutely unheard of in in the air conditioning world. Um, what we have budgeted this year is thirteen thousand dollars to replace air conditioning units. It's two units. We have between 100 and 137, depending on how you look at, our, at our, our chart and our responsibilities. But we have two units budgeted for repair this year. We really have got to figure out um, a priority, and that's something that we're going to be working on is kind of cleaning up our data. But we've got to look at, look at our investments in our, in our, in our, our buildings. Um, you can see, again, I just pulled some, some numbers there just to kind of give us an idea. You know, really, we probably ought to be putting in about almost $100,000 a year in just replacing units or, or planning to spend $100,000 a year and not 13. So you can see that red, red, yellow, green right there. So we know that we have over 59 of our units are older than 12 years. Again, at least 30 of them are older than 20 years or 20 years or, or older. Um, we only have 17 of the 137 that are that have been replaced in the last 12 years. 12 is kind of the average that they say for residential and things like that. So 12 to 20 is a good average. Uh, even if we let, made, made every unit last 20 years, we still ought to be replacing seven a year, and that's uh, about 50,000. So we're, we're gonna you're gonna see those numbers rising as we let these units basically die off. There are gonna be a lot more unbudgeted and unplanned replacements as, as this happens, and it's more money um, and more uh, time. Uh, involved in with troubleshooting and things like that. So again, it goes back to my efficiency thing I, I mentioned earlier. Really want to be more efficient and more proactive and, uh, rather than reactive like we are right now. So last slide. I know Edward again. I know I'm sorry. More than five minutes. Um, but <laughs> deferred maintenance. So we so real quick slide on this. Just, these are rough numbers. Again, based on information that we we have previously, we do an annual report uh, in our department that I'm working on the current on the 2020 update for that. Um, that identifies priorities. And let me preface this real quick by saying, our priorities, based on what I see, have not always been the priorities of all the other departments. I'm hoping to change that. In working with all the, the directors, um, I have um, you know, nothing but good things to say about everybody I've worked with so far with the city. Everybody has been uh, completely on board and, and um, uh, great to work with. All of, uh, there's really gonna be a lot of communication with the directors and saying, what do you need, not what do I think you need? That, that's that's uh, something I'm really uh, hoping to, 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 to clean up a little bit and say, and because the priority list, this $1.6 million over five years, that, those are roofs, those are painting, flooring. That's really, that's all, and maybe a few air conditioners every once in a while. Those are what we identify as priorities previously. Sorry. Um, so we're going to look at updating this more thoroughly. <laughs> And, and presenting more of what we what we and the directors and the, and the departments believe is what they need for five years from a facilities, uh, properties, grounds kind of kind of perspective. So, those are just some high numbers. We we've spent over the last three years on roofs, and really there was no roofs prior to that for a couple of years. Uh, almost seven hundred thirty thousand dollars just in roofing the last three years. Uh, three big ones: uh, part of City Hall, part of the fire department, uh, and fire station. Four, I believe, were the were the three big ones. So, um, again, a lot of numbers, a lot of data. But the, the point of the presentation is really to kind of show you a few of the things that we're working on. Again, po and point out that you know we are really looking at building relationships with the departments um, and building relationships with the administration and, and and figuring out what it is that we need and being clear with that and providing great um, great facilities for our for our staff and for the public. Um, our, our, um, we're, we're behind. Yeah, we're very, very far behind, and we're trying to get us on the, uh, on the right page. So, Good. with that, I'll answer any questions. Okay. Um, I know I went a little long, yeah. and I apologize for that. But any questions? It's Mr. a lot Constance? of data to, to throw at you. I'm sorry. <laughs> any questions? Um, well, first, uh, welcome. Thank you. And uh, you really did a thorough uh, inventory there. Um, I saw the, your staff. How big is your staff? 
it's, I'll stop. It's me plus two. <laughs> so um, this was a long laundry list. I mean, what are the future for your staff? That's that's one of the things I'm, I really need to sit down and figure out. Um, I know there's been some initial preliminary talks. Um, we really need to figure out what it is that we have and what we do. That That's that's something that and has changed a little bit over the last few months even. But uh, um, obviously, you know, I need to figure out the buildings and their condition. But I really need to figure out the condition of our staff and what it is that we're capable of doing. What is that we that we should be doing? There may okay. be things that we that don't fit our our our, uh, our our list of responsibilities. So we really need to sit down and figure that out. Again, that's working with the other de with the other departments as well to figure out what it is that we do. Um, so to answer your question, I don't know yet. <laughs> but but it, I mean, to me, it needs to grow. Um, it, and, and hopefully pulling, uh, pulling over uh, one of the, the employees from the recreation will, will help that. Uh, it'll definitely help, and it'll allow, allow me to take a step back and really evaluate and inventory what it is that we have and really build on that uh, in, uh, plan for yeah, the future. Because I, I personally know William and Jose, and, and they get pulled in every direction. And uh, the list that you just provided... Uh, I'm wondering, as you're talking, I'm like, okay, who's doing all of this? That, that, and it's a good point because we, we, we are absolutely spread there. I mean, I, they are. They, they are amazing. I, they I'll, are. I'll say that right now. They, they are absolutely amazing to work with. Um, they, they get pulled a million different directions all day, all day, every day. And it's very difficult, and that's one of the things I'm, I'm going to try to take a step back and, and evaluate what it is that we do, how we do it, and provide better service to, to each of the departments and, again, to the public. I mean, to, to make sure that we provide an exceptional service. That's my goal. But, but also think, uh, Commissioner Velasquez, as we get more proactive, I think right now they're, they're you know, still putting, you know, their thumbs in the, the, the holes and the, the yeah. leaking as we get to the point where we start getting all these roofs replaced and we get the, the HVACs replaced. So you'll be more minor work versus major work. And that's that's kind of where we fall behind is the major work, which is all, that'd be all subcontracted. You know, the roofing is all subcontracted. HVAC is all subcontracted. We may or may not do the, the paving just as a as a um, yeah. kind of a training less training uh, seminar for our, our new our new team there. But right. but so they're, yeah, they're, they're the team kind of hold the glue together, but it's not a, um, it's not the big projects or not, they're, they're, Mission. Yeah, and, yeah we, we are very, very reactive right now. Yeah. And that's something that is number one priority for me is, is figuring out how we can get, you know, tip more towards the proactive side. We're always going to be reactive. I mean, there are things, obviously, that we, you know, break, fix type scenarios. We're, we're going to have them. That's what we're here for. But, yeah, we really, really need to try to get get that shifted a little bit more where we can where we can be proactive and we can focus and be more, more efficient, uh, just like everything else. Mr. Bankson? Yeah, Joseph, welcome. I uh, appreciated your presentation. Great numbers on the roofing replacement cost. I, I thought that was great. Um, I'm absolutely with you on the LED lighting because to me that's smart money mm -hmm. because it'll pay for itself in the longer run. I'm never afraid to go that direction. Um, and <coughs> I, I really love getting it spaced out that it's a planned replacement rather than, as you said, not mm -hmm. being reactionary. Um, and so you had about 1.7 million there at the end. Was that oh, a five-year plan? So Roughly 338.5 annually. If we were budgeted to that, we could tackle this. We can, but again, that 1.6 is purely based on the annual reports that that my predecessors you know had to put together, and I and I don't know and I don't know what all went into that. I know looking at it, um, <laughs> again, only being here a few weeks, <laughs> you know, um, most of it was, you know, was structure was was the bones uh, in and not. Uh, not looking at bigger picture and, and some other uh, some changes and things like that. So, I don't want to put a, a ton of faith in that number. I want to be very clear about that. Um, some of some of that is probably front heavy. Some of the because we're looking at a you know year one, year two, year three, year four. We know year one. We probably know year two for the most part. Years three, four, and five, when you look at that report, are very very thin because we don't know what's happening because we are very or, uh, very reactive. So. I, I can't answer that for sure. I know based on what the data I have currently, it's very, very front heavy, very front heavy. So. As long as we're aiming for that as a goal, I think that's the right way to go. Yeah. Commissioner sure. Smith. Uh, let me also say welcome Thank you. Uh, on board. And is it possible for you to provide the council a copy of the report that you just gave us so as we move forward into the budgeting process, we can have that to refer to to make sure that mm -hmm. we meet all those things that uh, you indicated needs to be taken care of. 
I was worried for a moment there because I thought the mayor was about to volunteer us to do the painting. <laughs> he actually no, did. I, he actually did already. <laughs> he, he saw me paint down at the, uh, the Billy Dean. Yeah. <laughs> wasn't, wasn't pretty. <laughs> so we got some line striping doing you yellow, white, blue. No. <laughs> I know absolutely. I can I can provide you the, this information. And again, I, I mentioned that that annual report that's been done. I am working on the update. It's a little bit more complicated because I'm not the one who's wrote, written it the, la the last three years. So I'm trying to take a, a step back again and, and update it accurate and be more accurate with it. So I, I'll, so I'll, I'll provide you with it with well, it as, as soon as it's ready. It's interesting. I wanted him to put on there when these roofs were replaced last, and a lot of me couldn't even find. I'm sorry. Yes. The, the, you know when they. So who who knows how old a lot of them are? So we you know we need right. to. That's part of being proactive is yes. at least knowing when something should fail, and so you start to plan for it, which. Yeah, we, we have a lot of data, but the things I need, like roof ages and things like that, I, we had a roof analysis done a few years ago that, that outlined what we need to do, but it didn't have any of the previous data. Most of them where they had in the report, uh, you know, the roof age were all blank because we don't know. Uh, so there's a lot of data, and I need to work with other departments to, to, to pull that data back in and put it into our systems and figure out what we have. That, that's been a big challenge. Mr. Becker? Yeah, I'm <clears throat> sorry. It, Kind of follow up on Commissioner Velasco's point about employees. What? How do? How do you gauge that? So, like, if I'm talking to Chief McKinley or Chief Wylam, they're kind of looking at population size to use that as a proxy for how many employees they should have. Um, from a facility standpoint, what do you use? Is it number of buildings? Is it square footage? Is it number of AC units? What, how do you? How do you kind of approach that? Well, it's basically all of the above. Um, one of the things I point out early on was the, the the numbers that the work orders. Work orders are great. You know, a lot of a lot of companies use the work order count to kind of to base their their FTE, you know, their ratio. Work orders are tr are, are tricky because you know we're we're very reactionary uh, to and, and one work order may be a five minute fix and one may be twelve hours. And we in our system again, I mentioned that we we're kind of transitioning or, or looking to transition. Uh, the system we use now, which is the same system that the rest of the city departments use, iWorks, uh, doesn't allow us much visibility into what we do. Um, the system I'm looking at now still doesn't get us get us really where I want to be. Um, there's other things out there, but they're very expensive. So I'm trying to find a, a good solution to just track what it is we do. Um, and we're, we're, on, we're, we're getting there. Um, with that data, hopefully I'll be able to have a better picture of what it is that we're doing um, and what it is that we need to do. So um, work order count um, you know, and time spent on jobs, things like that will be very helpful. But yeah, facilities, square footage, um, those are good things to look at. You know, plus, and we can benchmark you know, other cities and other, uh, other uh, similar, mm -hmm. uh, uh, similar departments uh, to kind of figure out where we need to be. Because two is not enough, but you know, if you ask me what the answer is, uh, like, you know, like you mentioned earlier, I don't know right now what that answer is. Yeah, and the mayor touched on it a little bit too. You know, a lot of the heavy lifting on these, some of these bigger capital projects, like the roofing or the AC replacements, things like that, are are generally outsourced. Mm -hmm. So, of that 1.6 million, generally speaking, is that majority capital outlay and and, yes. and contractor cost? Yes. And yes. does that include is that inclusive of the roofing figures that you had on there, the prioritized not, not, list? Not the previous ones, no. Yes, so but the ones that are still prioritized um, to yes. be to be completed. Yes. yes. Right. So generally speaking, if we replaced all the roofs on our priority list, it's roughly $500,000, which would be 1% of our general fund expenditure in any given year. So, Correct. you know, if the risk is there, <laughs> let's explore it, right? We're, right? we're just through Q1 of this year, but we're halfway home to budget season. And this is the type of conversation that we should be having during those workshops. It's, it's here's the need. If we don't fund it this year, you're, you're going to have a deluge of water in, in this particular facility, and it's going to be this risk factor. So. Right. Um, I like that you're kind of pulling together all this analysis. That's where I tend to gravitate towards. So I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Joe. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Just as a, is this kind of a funny FYI for my <clears throat> good friend, the representative, uh, his last name is Chris Foley, who happened to be a speaker of the house in 2014 to 16. And we just hired Jeff Weatherford, our public works director. Jeff Weatherford was a speaker when I was a senior, so 2012. So just so I had to take a picture of J Joe and Jeff and send it to Speaker Christofoli and, and Speaker Weatherford says, "Hey, look, I, I can't get you guys here in Apopka, but I've got your two cousins." You know. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a we had a good conversation with the my, my two former speakers. So anyway, thank you, right. Joe. Appreciate it. I forgot to mention we got. Uh, School board member Melissa Bird's here with us today. She slipped in over here on the on the end of the 
row here. So, okay, next up, I think we're up to public comment, public comment period. Susan? <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Rod Olson, 3156 Rolling Hills Lane, Apopka. All right, Happy New Year. Thank you for all you do uh, and hope 21. 2021 is going to be a better year than 2020. Uh, I had not planned to speak today, uh, but I came with an eyelash of a head-on crash again on Rock, on Rock, Rock Springs Road. Uh, something has got to be done with the speeds between Leicester and the county building. Uh, I don't recall in the last month going by there where there isn't a pedestrian trying to wiggle across that's almost hit. Um, nine years ago, my daughter and three granddaughters at that time, she was seven months pregnant, went into premature labor on a head-on crash at Welsh, at Welsh and uh, Rock Springs. So something has got to be done with that speed. Uh, I know that at least two pedestrian inc in incidents occurred in the last 18 months. Uh, we need to look at what can be done to control the speed along there and whether or not with all of those, I mean, there's 550 or 60 trailers with kids spewing out, hanging across there, whether it's a crosswalk with a light or a bridge or something, someone's going to die, and we don't need that. That's it. Thank I think you, that's, that's a county, that's the county part of Rock Springs Road, right, Pam? I mean, I thought, and I don't know whether that would that be in the, 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 uh, the study we're getting done now, any, uh, we wouldn't go that far, would it? Oh, okay. We got new development there. We got on yep. the southeast corner. We got some more things going there. It's just going to bring more and more traffic. So it's a county issue. Then I will be addressing the county. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank and you. The only, the only thing I would follow up on that one is not the speed issue, but the only accidents that I've seen recently have been again people going out of Publix trying to make a left hand turn instead of a, instead of a right. Yeah. Uh, previously, we had talked about those reflector partition going up is that still happening or is uh, Pam do you want to address that thank thank you Rod the last time that I followed up with Orange County they're still going to do that well they don't want to put the reflectors in the median what they want to do is put a big um, cement barrier to force a right in right out so that you can't left into the Publix um, but they don't want to do it as a standalone project, economy of scale and all that. So whenever they have a crew out there, that's when they've committed to doing that for us. Okay. And then last thing, because it's fresh in my mind, you know how we, Orange County did the whole two right-hand turn lanes going north on Rock Springs Road? I've not seen one car actually make a turn from that center lane yet. Um, is it possible to solid stripe that, that arc so that people are aware that they should stay in their lane on the right-hand side and the ones going north from the middle lane, that's an option. I don't know how we educate people there. It's, I think it's possible, but I think the better solution is to take it back to where we had it before we made that improvement, which was um, we had a continuous right um, green arrow so that if you were trying to make that right turn from the right lane, you didn't have to stop before you turned mm -hmm. right on red. And people seem to um, adapt to that a little better. It's, it's just, it's a tight turn and the way it is now and people aren't comfortable making it. Also, they're usually not thinking that somebody beside them on, on their left is gonna be turning with them. Um, they tend to drift to the they, to the. They to tend the to drift a little and bit and it, it's an uncomfortable movement, which is why um, what you're not seeing what we'd hope to see. Well, I mean, even visual cue wise, though, if you have a solid, a solid stripe versus the checkered typical one, that might we, we could try that. Then, That's really easy to do before we change it back. Yeah. And I don't know if we ever had one of those sign um, things there to kind of cue people into center lane turns right now. I mean. We had we had put there, I think Orange County had put there before talking about signalization and how that had changed, but I don't know that we educated drivers to say that middle <coughs> lane now is a, is a northbound turn lane. I, it's either hanging above, I, I don't recall that there's a sign on the side of the road well, like yeah, one of these, what you would expect to see. A temporary thing, you know, like things yeah. that talk about festivals happening, things like that, where it's, people right. pay attention to it. 
I mean, those are things that are easy to do and they can be done fast. We can do those and they're relatively inexpensive. We could try that um, before we pursue changing it back to the iteration before. We're gonna kick the study off for the whole intersection and area. Well, I had hoped this month, I'm just waiting on Metro plan to um, execute the contract for the study. It's, it's pretty expensive. I think it's like $350,000, but it's on their dime, so. Um, but that's still for the, the longer term fix. So if you want, Commissioner, if you want me to pursue that, I'm, I'm happy to do that. We can try it. I'm happy to try that. Well, I mean, I'm not passionate one way or the other. I've just, I've seen people on social media just recently that talked about, hey, I thought this whole northbound middle turn lane change to that intersection was going to alleviate some of the pressure of that, the backup that occurs on Welch. It's never going to be perfect, obviously. But no, not totally again, perfect. I've, I've traveled that intersection daily. I've never seen personally anybody turning from that middle right northbound turn lane. So I don't know if it's just an education thing. To the mayor's point, people drift because it's got that dotted line and people are just used to it. I mean, it was like that for decades, right? Since so. the light went in, yeah. So, I mean, if we're going to keep the road engineered how it is, I think it's worth the effort of trying to educate people so that they are 100% aware that that's the intent. Well, I'll, yeah. I'll look into that and see if, if, if that's something we can do. Okay. Thank you, Pam. All right, Susan, anybody else? Okay, David. I'm David Hoffman. I live at 3610 Tayside Court, Apopka. Before the timer starts, I don't wish, wish all of you Happy New Year, and may the new year bring to you and your families good health and dream fulfillment. Thank you, David. Okay. Homeowners and residents at Rock Springs Ridge have made it clear over the past several months that we vehemently oppose the plan, plan building and development assault against our community. But the golf group principles could not care less about our community values, identity, character, and family legacies. It is a safe assumption that our families subscribe to the value-laden terms work, family, neighborhood, freedom, and peace. These words were the foundation of Ronald Reagan's planned presidential run beginning in 1978. January 20th, Two weeks from today will be the 40th anniversary of Ronald Reagan's taking the presidential oath of office. If they have their way, the golf group owners will make a mockery of Ronald Reagan's value-laden foundational terms. I can speak for my wife, our family, and our family legacy, and no doubt, many of our neighbors. For the first time, in the broad expanse of our family's history, going back at least three generations, our immediate family is burdened with a planned assault against our home, our family legacy, our neighborhood, our neighbors. All so that three out of town wealthy plutocrats can have more, much more, while 1,320 homeowners <coughs> end up with less. Subtraction through addition. Work, the value of our decades-long work is diminished. Family, our family's grasp of the American dream is compromised. Neighborhood, our neighborhoods and our community's quest for self-determination has been called into question, even disrespected over the past 11 and a half years. Freedom, our freedom to define and protect our neighborhood and the legacy for our children is under threat, partly because we cannot be confident that our elected city officials will help us citizens at whose pleasure you serve. Peace, for my wife and me, there has been little peace at Rock Springs Ridge over the past 11 and a half years. 
that, re that Reagan's irrefutable value-laden campaign framework is being distorted here in Apopka, certainly a key location of Reagan land, is richly ironic. However, our resolve to defend our home, our family legacy, and our neighborhood has never been greater in this David and Goliath struggle. Um, I just wanted to say that some of the information I found comes from a new book just released on October 1st, 2020, Reagan Land by Rick Perlstein, copyright uh, 2020, page 389. Uh, I just, it just triggered a thought process. Uh, you may not agree with me, but uh, I'm calm, oh, by the way, Congratulations to you, uh, Diane uh, Velasquez, on your victory for our community. Thank you. We're confident you will help us. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, me. David. Appreciate it. Anybody else, Susan? Yes, sir. Good. Thank you. All right, the consent agenda. Anybody wish to pull any items off the consent agenda? If not, look for uh, a motion to approve. Uh, just a comment on it as we look at the... Uh, the different hours, this, the number one, it seemed to be $60 an hour more than the other engineering. It just seemed like an awful steep amount. But I mean, if that's where engineering is at, and if, if we're only allowed to use them for that project and others for the other, um, I just, to me, it just seemed a little, little steep. The way it works, Commissioner, is, and Pam can give okay. you a better understanding. Pam can explain that better for you. So I'll let her do that. But we have <clears throat> contracts with these individuals, these engineering firms, <clears throat> already executed. And so once you've executed, the one is a change order. So we have to stay within their contract. Mm -hmm. The other one is a new one that, and Pam can explain to you how that pricing works. Yeah, I was just more looking at number one, and the staff hours average just seemed to be higher than the others. And, and the reason that we selected metric to do um, the signal at Errol and 441 is because they specialize in doing signal work. In fact, they're known around the state as being one of the best. Plus, because it's a doing, DOT doing what, signal. Doing what, Pam? I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. They're, um, they're known as being signal experts okay. within the field of engineering. Plus, they are one of DOT's um, consultants that they have under contract. So they have relationships that we need at DOT um, to have a, a smoother process as we're dealing with them on the signal that's actually a DOT asset that we're gonna be working on. Mm -hmm. So it's not, yes, the five consultants that we have, they all have different rates, but they all have areas of, of specialty that we will be calling on them to um, do different projects. Like we're using, for the, the second item, we're using, there we're using metric, I mean, uh, um, Newkirk Engineering. They do um, really great design work. We have, Others that are better maybe at trails. Um, in general, I, I'd say they're all excellent. I know them all personally, all the firms personally. Um, and they just, you know, they have different overhead rates. Different, they're just different kinds of business. Newkirk is smaller and newer, so their prices are lower. Um, mm -hmm. Metrics kind of in the middle. <laughs> then we have a consultant, um, Kimley Horn. They're kind of a large national firm, higher overhead. They do top rate work, but they're probably a little at the higher end of the spectrum. But there's nothing that I saw in any of their prices when we put them under contract that exceeds the norm. And uh, again, I'm not always, let's aim at the, at the cheapest because, you know, you get what you pay for. So if there's That's, an overriding reason that justifies that, you know, I'm okay. I just, <laughs> it just seemed a little bit high comparatively to the others. So thank you. That, that explains. Hey, the, my only other question was on uh, <laughs> item number two. So I know that within the scope of work, they're going to do the engineering for the, the emergency signalization coming out of the station, but are they making assumptions using the design? Because one of the benefits when we designed Station 5 was the reuse of the plans, the design. I don't know if that's still the, the strategy for building Station 6, but I just want to make sure that they have that, yeah. Yeah, that plan in mind when they're doing their engineering. Yeah, Chief is nodding his head, yes. Yeah. Okay. yes. Th this is just to do just the signal work. It doesn't really have anything to do with the... I get it, but like yeah. where the signal happens, knowing how wide a station is or where the entry, at, in, ingress, egress points are, obviously all that would come into play, I would assume. Okay. Yeah. Any other, if not, look for a motion to approve the consent agenda as read. So moved. We got a motion by Commissioner Smith. 
Second. Second by Commissioner Becker. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, business item, chief. We love it when guys, when our chiefs can save us money. <laughs> McKinley, you need to save us some money too, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Mayor, commissioners, just vast members of the public. Happy New Year. Okay, 2021's kick it off right. Um, I'm excited to be here today to uh, present something um, we've been working on uh, pretty hard on. Uh, it's uh, um, a budget amendment request, uh, and we're going to talk some of the balance. funny when I walked in, uh, Mr. Phil asked what uh, an air pack was or an SCBA, so I'm kind of excited to educate everyone on it. <laughs> um, uh, SCBAs are self-contained breathing apparatus, also called air packs, and believe it or not, the pack is not spelled wrong, I promise. That's just the brand name, so it's missing the C, but um, another fun fact, if you add underwater in there, you get scuba. So that's kind of where scuba comes from and stuff. So <laughs> bring that price. But they're basically the air packs that we wear um, when we have to go in um, IDLH or immediately dangerous to life and health environments, fire, hazmat scenes, things like that. So um, we currently operate with a total of 75 Scott air packs. Um, again, when you talk <coughs> about you know, the grand scheme of things, these packs on average cost about $7,000 a piece. Easy. Um, new updates, different things like that, NFA, NFPA compliancy um, changes often. And to kind of get a little how, how that works, every four years to five years, different standards or NFPA standards get updated. Um, and based on those standards and those updates, we have to make sure that we're compliant with those certain things, depending on um, what type of piece of equipment we're talking about. In particular to um, self-contained grinding apparatus, um, we can actually we still use air packs four standards behind. So that's about 16 to 20 years if you look at that we can still have air packs in service. Um, as of effective of 2018 and 19, two different standards got adjusted for the SCBAs. One specific for the SCBAs and one for the PASS devices, which are the personal alert safety systems. That's something that's integrated to a, an air pack. So if a firefighter goes down um, and stops moving for period of greater than 30 seconds, alarm alerts, and actually alerts the computer and our district chief's truck and everything. So that standard also got updated for 2019. Um, right now, of those 75 packs, uh, we have a combination of the 2004 NXGs. I'm going to throw a lot of numbers at you, but I'll kind of hopefully can explain a little bit better. But NXGs and 2013 um, X3 air packs. Those are the years of the compliancy. So we have packs as old 16 and 20 years old that we've been trying to slowly integrate and, and, uh, and update as we go along. Um, after 2022, the 2004 NXGs will not, no longer be certified for use. We are fully compliant right now. We have, we can move forward till 2022 and keep using the same air packs. Um, however, at that point, they will no longer be even serviceable. We will not be allowed to work on those air packs. Our reps that come out and fix those won't be able to use them as well. Um, so again, after 2022, all SCPAs must be compliant to that 2018 and 19 compliancy as well. So it's another requirement we're trying to deal with. We had a plan in place. Um, we still have that plan in place. It's a, um, the air pack replacement program. Last year, we started with that. Um, we replaced 14 of the air, uh, air packs with the X3 Pros. So now you see that extra word in there, Pro. That is now includes the 2018 compliancy update. So any air pack we buy from now on, meets that standard. The problem, and every fire chief in the region, I've talked to several of them, the problem with that is now they've changed some of the requirements with the past devices and with our buddy breathing systems. Um, basically, if we put one of these new packs into service today, it does not work or integrate with any of our existing air packs, all 43 that we still have left to replace. So the plan was to replace a few this year, a few next year, a few next year, and then, so by the time we get to 2022, we now can integrate all of our air packs. Does that make sense so far? Um, so again, we've replaced 14 of them thus far. Um, the need still for the next uh, you know, capital outlay, what we're looking at is 43 of the X3 Pro 2000 certified, 2018 certified um, to replace those 2004 packs. We currently have 18, and this is where it gets confusing again, X3 
2013 certified packs. Those were purchased for station five and six when they opened. Um, those opened in 2017. We bought them in 2017. So they're newer than 2013, but they still are on that compliancy ruling for that four year period. Um, those need to be modified to the 2018 standard. Um, we also have three RIP bags or packs that need to be modified to the 2018 compliance. Those are the um, packs we bring in if an unfortunate instance happens where a firefighter goes down. Our team goes in with this extra pack that actually can integrate and hook into their air supply if they're stuck or something like that. So it's a rescue um, type pack that we use for uh, that sort of thing. Also, our new tower truck, believe it or not, is brand new, 2017, needs to be updated to this new modification. That's just the way um, the fire service works. And it's <laughs> maddening sometimes. But um, so we also need that mod modification to happen to work with our, these new air packs moving forward. So again, our need, the 43 air packs, um, the 18 uh, X, older X3 models need to be updated. Um, we need the three rip bags and then tower trucks. Uh, the good news I have for you, again, the list price for 43 air packs was $7,900, whoa, whoa, sorry, <laughs> I threw an extra zero in there, $7,900 approximately. For a cost of $43,000 if we had to replace all 43 of our air packs. Um, we've been working really hard. Uh, uh, Division Chief John Howe has been uh, talking a lot with our rep, um, talking with them. We actually got our price reduced down from our estimate from last year to about $6,500 an air pack. Uh, that's an immediate $63,000 savings we have by purchasing ahead of time. Um, also, the replacement for the or upgrade need for the X3s, the current 18 air packs we have in service, is about $10,000. That was Scott's solution, um, Scott being the, the company that builds the air packs, to modify any existing air pack. So I talked to Coe's chief, I talked to Orange County, I talked to a bunch of chiefs where they said they were gonna have to pay f about $585 for every existing air pack that's out there just to update it to the new standard. So that's what we're, we're also faced with. Um, three rip bags again, compliancy for that, it's gonna be about 1800 to get them up to 2018 compliance. And the tower truck uh, modification is about $800. So all this together is about $293,000 that, we that we're faced with. Again, um, what we had budgeted this year, $106,500, was for the, an additional 15 air packs for this year. So we replaced 14 last year. We're going we're gonna to replace 15, 15, and then 15 for the next four years to get us where we needed to be. So if you subtract that out, for the budgeted amount we have for 2020 and 21. Also, um, a few, I forget exactly when, a few meetings ago, we spoke about um, one of the, the savings that we found. Uh, we got uh, reimbursement through the state of Florida for our supplemental complimentary um, um, college reimbursement payments. Um, we're happy to excited, and this is the email that's saying that the money is coming to us. So we have $134,000 that we weren't expecting um, that we were able to find. Uh, that we were, you know, working with the staff, we want to apply that to this, uh, this need as well. The Department of Revenue, again, says the, the money is on the way. Again, that's kind of why we've waited to this point to present this to you, because it is, in fact, on the way, so we're excited about that. So with those, the 93000 less, both those, we have about a $51,000 gap um, that's, that's an additional need. When you look at our capital outlay, our capital improvement plan over the next two years, we also had to take into account, we had 111,000 sl slated for the next fiscal year and an additional 117,000 minimum slated for the next, that's, that's about a 5% you know, cost increase just based on the number of air packs we were gonna need. So that total, um, again, the planned expenditures we were gonna have were $229,000 um, over the next couple years. This less the $51,000 is about another $177,000 savings we're making over the next few years, if we're able to do accomplish this now. Um, what also is amazing, I, I think it's amazing, <laughs> about this, <laughs> this, uh, this uh, uh, purchase is all the air packs now that we're currently buying, and this is a picture of the nice, pretty new X3 Pro, um, they come with a lifetime warranty. All of our existing air packs had limited warranties. In fact, most of our older ones were out of warranty. 
we had the budget and we're spending at least $7,500 a year just on maintenance to keep us operating. Um, so if you look at that expenditure over the next two years, we're, that's an immediate $15,000 savings we have as well. You know, this again, um, that Scott has offered is, is a phenomenal, um, phenomenal program that we can take advantage of. Um, some of the benefits, again, for doing this is all 75 air packs now be 2018 NFPA compliant immediately. Um, we'll be able to put these in service as soon as we get them. That's the nice thing, we get everything integrated. Um, again, all 75 air packs would then be covered under a repair warranty. And even our existing 18 that we have from station five and six are covered under warranty for the next 15 years, to, you know, depending on what's broken and things like that. So we immediately go from having to pay a lot of warranty costs and a lot of uh, repair costs to one, the compliance is back um, and everything is up to snuff and saving money in, on cost and repairs um, daily. Other thing, benefits, of course, is the new harness materials. I, don't, it's just, I kind of went fast through the pictures, but we can actually completely remove the harness on these air packs and throw them into our um, washer, washing machine, keep them clean. It's a lot safer for our firefighters. Um, it's very easy to remove and allows for cleaning uh, efforts. So th that's another, obviously, big benefit for us. So to kind of sum it all up, we're uh, asking for to replace all the air packs and upgrading some of our existing air packs. The total cost overall will be uh, $293,000, but because we have the 106 slotted for this year, plus the state money we're getting, we're asking for an additional 51, almost $52,000 from reserves to accomplish this this year. If I can answer any questions. Any questions, Commissioner Becker? So at the end of the day, we're just accelerating the purchase of these things, <clears throat> and you need $50,000 to do that. Yep. So the capital outlay in the future years in the CIP plan then get reallocated to something else. Yeah, we can exactly. give that to Joe for his facilities, yeah. correct? <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, I like you, that, that you mentioned right. that, absolutely. You know, that can be reallocated to other needs that, that are out there. This is something, you know, it's immediate savings, and, and the compliance issues, you know, big too. That's, we're, we'll be good for at least 16 years with air packs. That's huge. Commissioner Smith? Sounds like a good plan. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Fankson. Um, well, the only thing is that, you know, lifetime warranty, but what if they change the bar four years from now? Do well, these go obsolete, or do we have any kind of guarantee that because they can last 16 years, mm -hmm. we'll be able to use them for 16? Right. And that's the beautiful thing. That's why I said it's an it's a awesome plan. Um, it's, in fact, I have information. It's called As Long As You Own It, Air Pack Warranty from Scott. Um, different than anything we've had in the past. It includes any of those updates or upgrades. Okay. So anything that we're, like, like now we're having to deal with the $500 per air pack that suddenly NFPA decides, you know, that fire chiefs love. <laughs> Not really. But that, that will be included with this warranty. So, okay. And, yeah. and the ones where we have to increase it by $500, are we going to do that to bring them up? Yes. Or are we replacing those? No, no, that, that's part of that. that okay. Because I was going to say, if we, cost. if we weren't, we, can we surplus those? But... Sorry, well, the, the nice thing about if we the, the 18 existing, we're actually going to put on our reserve units, okay. um, and then any front run will be the latest and greatest air packs, and some of those, um, not, not even older than their 2017 air packs, so they're still are, are our backups, which is beautiful. We're right. set for a, a while. Yeah, that sounds good. Good work. Commissioner Velasquez? Oh, you had mentioned state reimbursement. I'm sorry, I didn't get okay. where that uh, state yeah, I'm sorry. reimbursement is from. Yeah, yeah the... Um, I've, we did a presentation a couple weeks ago on some of, uh, of our, our financial recoveries and things we've done with the fire department. Um, we discovered, looking through, well, actually we got a new program called Power DMS. Um, it's a computer program that we're looking at and how we can reorganize stuff. And through uploading some of our stuff, we found that since 2014, we had not been reporting our, our quarterly reports to the state of Florida, to, particularly to the fire marshal's office. Um, any firefighter who has a college degree um, and anything uh, fire or EMS related gets supplement each check from the state. Well, the city has been paying that out since 2014. Um, we reported this to the state and they said, oh, you're, you're absolutely right. If you, if you turn in all those past reports all the way back to 2014, we'll cut you a check for what we owe you. So now we're just paying the city back basically for everything we've been paying out. So this is an uh, extra amount of money we didn't expect to have. So you pay for the 
the training for the uh, firefighters? I, I no, it's a supplemental comp is a, a program. So if, if a firefighter A goes out and gets a degree in EMS, right. they, they come to basically through our administration. We spit out the paperwork for them for the state, turn in their paperwork to the state, and they actually get reimbursed um, for the, from the state. Uh, 50, I think it's $100 a, a paycheck for having their degree, and it's state allocated money. Well, so we were paying it out, but we were never re, um, getting that money back from the state since 2014. So, do, are, the, are the firefighters required to go for recertification on it's any of their, uh, I guess, degrees or what? It depends. There are certain things that, that you, so, firefighter, there's, that's a kind of a long answer. Firefighter one and two, which is what you're required to be a firefighter, as long as you're actively working, you don't have to seek recertification. Okay. Um, if you're a fire officer, any of the fire officer one, two, three, four, you do not have to seek certification. Fire inspector, you have to take a class every four years, and then you're recertified. So there are some, depending on what, but to keep your job mainly as a firefighter, more on the EMS side, we do training with that, but that's all done in-house. So does okay. that answer your question? Yeah. Because I didn't understand why mm -hmm. you were getting the state reimbursement. And mm -hmm. you had mentioned something about college, so I didn't yeah. quite understand how it was. Yes, ma'am. Um, I guess with the air packs, a total of how many air packs do you have for the firemen? Total, what? we have 75 to, to, for operating. And just because um, I, I'm kind of trying to catch up. Um, mm -hmm. It's too bad you couldn't bring me an air pack to show me. Do they use that? Does each firefighter use that all the time? Is that part of their so, uh, daily equipment when they go out to a fire? Is that something that each of them have to have? Yes. And so they're all in compliance right now? I'm sorry? Are they all in compliance yes, right now? Yes, mm ma'am. -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Each, so each fire truck has six air packs assigned to it. Right. Each ambulance has one air pack assigned to it. The squads each have two air packs assigned to them. So those actually ride on the units that the fire, if the whatever apparatus that firefighter is on that day, that's their air pack. Okay. So is that, and that includes our, our backup units as well. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Okay. We need to look for a motion to approve, to authorize the expenditure for the purchase of air packs for the fire department. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Banks. Second. Second, Second by Commissioner oh, Smith. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries NIMS. Thanks, Thank Chief. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. for looking out for us. Yep. I'm just waiting on McKinley to bring us some money, too. <laughs> All right. Public Ordinance number 2810. Susan? Ordinance number 2810, an ordinance of the city of Apopka, Florida, amending the future land use element of the Apopka Comprehensive Plan of the city of Apopka, changing the future land use designation from office to mixed use for certain real property located south of East Oak Street and west of North Forest <coughs> Avenue, comprising point, 0 0.13 acres more or less and owned by Carpenter Companies Florida LLC, providing for severability and for an effective date. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Commissioners. Phil Martinez, Planner 2 with the City's Planning Division. The applicant is proposing a small-scale future land use amendment from office to mixed use for approximately 0.13 acres. The subject property is highlighted in yellow and located south of East Oak Street and west of North Forest Avenue. To the north is the Advent Health Medical Plaza, to the east is a Bright House substation and the Fran Carlton Center. To the south is a vacant property and single family homes. And to the west are medical offices and a place of worship. The applicant has expressed intent to construct a single family home on the property. The property is owned mixed use downtown district, which is compatible with the proposed mixed use future land use. And the mixed use downtown zoning permits single family homes. The subject area is approximately 0.13 acres with office future land use, and the office future land use with mixed use downtown zoning does not permit residential units. A mixture of uses can be found in the vicinity, ranging from offices to single family and civic uses. 
Staff and the applicant view the proposed mixed use future land use to be appropriate for the subject area, as well as the area comprising a mixture of uses. The Development Review Committee and Planning Commission recommend approval of the proposed small scale future land use amendment from office to mixed use. And the recommended motion for this afternoon is to accept the first reading of ordinance number 2810 and hold it over for second reading and adoption on January 20th, 2021. This concludes my presentation, and I'd be happy to address any questions that you may have. Any questions for Phil? So, <clears throat> I mean, it just seems kind of odd. I didn't realize that it was the intent to do just one residential on it. It's going to kind of the next piece of business where we're trying to reduce an enclave. This one almost kind of create an enclave in terms of residential use versus its current. Um, do we see any concerns there? Because you're going to have residential basically surrounded in all, all parts by non-residential use. Staff's intent for this area is that there are park spaces that are, serve as a great amenity for nearby residential units, and should one have the ability to also provide non-residential uses like professional offices, uh, places of worship, restaurants, then it can create a mixed-use area that is walkable, uh, and has many amenities nearby. Yeah, because like this is just your future land use, but we are, already have residential on some of those blocks, correct? Yes, sir. Anybody else? Questions? Okay. All right. Is the applicant here? Guess not. Okay. Anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? Sure. Come on down. No, no, no. You need to come down and get in front of the mic. Sorry about that. Uh, just as one resident among, what, 53,000, I have a question uh, and a, a concern, uh, and it all has to do with density, for one thing. So am I to understand that the proposal here is for one home on what looks to be an eighth of an acre? Is that about right? Correct. Yeah. Okay, David, sorry. can you give your name and address for the record, please? Oh, excuse me. I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, David Hoffman, uh, 3610 Tayside Court. Excuse me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so how big is the home? That's a better question. Well, well this, not, this is just for the first reading for the small. Okay, so the, the proposal, actual proposal for the home size hasn't been submitted. Is that it? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else from the public wish to speak on this matter? Not, we'll close the public hearing, look for motion to approve ordinance number 2810 at first reading and hold over for a second reading and adoption. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Bankson. Second. Second by Commissioner Smith. I, just one comment sure. before it. You know, I, obviously, this is first reading, but my, again, I still got concerned because the future land use map is all office around that area. Yeah. Um, and, no. oh, come on. Yeah. It does. Yeah. Jim Hay, Community yes. Development Director. Um, yeah, the, the, the future land use does have office, but there are existing uses that are basically non conforming uses that are residential to the south. It's just that the. the no, I get it. I mean, but the intent, long, but the long term strategy, right? I mean. <clears throat> the long term strategy would be for office, but it hasn't occurred. And it's been like this for quite a number of years. So uh, this person just wants to make use of their property. Yeah. Yeah. I, it, I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, not to believe it. We did talk We could discuss <laughs> between the next hearing, but yeah, I just have concerns there. Yeah. We did talk to them about that, you know, with the options to, to go with an office since it is directly across the street from the, uh, the Advent Health Building. So. Because it's the same challenges that we would have seen up at the airport, right? You had concerns about, you know, residential goes in, and then you've got concern by the people at the airport because, hey, residential goes in, and then 10 years from now they start complaining because of no noise pollution. <laughs> yes. Same, same issue here. You, you get residential, and then everybody around them says, hey, my real estate's valuable because I'm in an office, future land use, and uh, mixed-use uh, downtown zoning district. Yep. And I'm going to sell out, and this person then gets surrounded by office space or commercial or retail. It's the same kind of issue, right? And so yes. I just want to make sure that we're... Yeah, and the interesting part is that you know, with, with this building here, if that would have stayed a hospital, you, know, you usually see the progression of going to offices, going you know, addition, uh, adjacent to those uses. It did occur here, and it is here, and it, it is some of or on this side also, but... Um, this 
lot, you know, who knows, maybe once the house is built, you know, five, six years from now or 10 years from now, they might come back in and go, hey, I want to make that an office. And then they'll be back in to, to change it. <laughs> I would like to schedule some time with you between now and the next session, though, just to talk mm -hmm. through that one. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> we, we try to encourage those uses that are, you know, reflected by the land use, but you know, they, are, they are the property owners. <laughs> Okay, so we have a motion by Commissioner Bankson and a second by Commissioner Smith. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, we have ordinance number 2812. Okay, ordinance number 2812. An ordinance of the City of Apopka, Florida to extend its territorial and municipal limits to index pursuant to section 171.044 Florida statutes. The here and after described land situated in being in Orange County. Florida, owned by Apopka Centerline Development, located north of Boy Scout Road and east of South Binion Road, providing for directions to the city clerk, severability, conflicts, and an effective date. Okay, our newest addition to the planning department, Allison Williams. I've told him to go easy on you, but I can't, I can't guarantee you. This is a tough crowd up here, so oh, man. better do a good job. <laughs> Good afternoon, Allison Williams, Planner One with the City's Planning Division. Today, we have a request to annex a 9.487 acre parcel into the City of Apopka. The subject property is located at 1879 Boy Scout Road. The subject property is contiguous to the city limits and eligible for annexation pursuant to Florida Statute 171. The annexation will eliminate an existing enclave and the proposed property is a part of a larger proposed plan development, the Bronson per property and it's currently under staff review. The DRC recommends approval, staff recommends approval, and myself and the applicant are here if you have any questions. Boy, come on, somebody give her a tough question. <laughs> Mr. Smith. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's gonna go back to the intersection of John's Road and Claycona or Popka Road, depending on what the development is gonna be. So we're not at that point yet, so I hold off to the okay. next. Okay. <laughs> Any questions for Allison? Okay. Is the, the applicants here? Okay, would you like to come up? <laughs> Thank you, Allison. Good job. Good afternoon. Erica Hughes with VHB 225 East Robinson, Orlando, Florida, 32801. We concur with staff's uh, recommendation and are available for any questions. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Anybody from the public wish to speak on this matter? Sure. Come on down. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Kelly Shirley, and I live at 1885 Boy Scout Road. I own the uh, 40 acres in the back of the annexation here, and I have an easement of 30 feet that goes from the road all the way back to my property, which is basically about 1,500 feet by 30. Um, my, I tried coming in earlier just to find out, you know, what's going on with the... Uh, annexation and of course it's going to be part of a bigger annexation and that will be directly associated with my property at that particular time um, so you're okay okay yeah mine goes okay. uh, yep. yeah I'm all the way back in the back there right there oh you're Correct. farther back you go back the second lot. Oh, okay <clears throat> yeah and the uh, and my uh, easement is uh, associated with my uh, property deed and everything of that sort. Yes, I had that done uh, when I bought the property hmm. and made sure all that was, you know, properly done. Sure. But, uh, yeah, the, you know, I didn't know exactly what they were planning on doing or how they were going to do it and how, what the part of the bigger portion of that was going to be. Um, what I would suggest, I know that we've got some kind of preliminary plans now already kind of for the whole area. You might want to just, you know, make an appointment and have come down and, and we can kind of show you. Obviously, it can change, but at least kind right. of give you a, a bird's eye view of where we're kind of at with the, the property around you currently. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that's what I, I came down a little bit earlier and I was trying to get that okay. information. And, sure. And uh, so anyway, I came in to, you know, make more formal addressing of sure. this. Uh, but one of my main concerns is, of course, runoff. Um, on my property and, of course, associating my uh, 
may, uh, you know, like with new homes going in there, they're going to be fertilization, and that's going to, uh, and of course, 80% of fertilization goes into the, the water uh, table. And so I'm concerned with my well, and the plants that we plant in the back there are very uh, metal sensitive, so, um, you know, we don't want the uptake of that. That could cost me millions of dollars, basically. Yeah. Um, because we we haven't done anything back there in the property to we've been trying to keep it organic and we've been you know there's no fertilization no uh, herbicides pesticides or um, you know and we've been keeping it you know clean you know basically um, so I'm not sure if they're gonna put walls in there or <laughs> I, we're real, I, just real don't, I just don't know yeah. exactly no, no. what's happening. I, so, yeah. you know, that's why I came down, just sure. to kind of get a, sure. a better of, understanding and let you know yeah. that uh, I'm part of your community. Um, mm -hmm. I'm actually a pharmacist here in uh, with Walgreens, and I oh, work wow. at okay. uh, Main Street and uh, Rock Springs. So if oh, you wow. need any help, I am closely <laughs> available. I'm doing the shots for the COVID as well. So, <laughs> Well, I think what we need, you know, as we kind of move along in the process, we're still – 8, 10, 12 months out as we kind of go along. So I would, what you'll do, if you'll just make sure you get with either Jim or Bobby or both and just kind of stay in the loop. And so as we start to, you know, as it starts to kind of formulate and, and you know, we kind of finalize details, keep you in that loop, I, I'm, you know, we're happy to do that for you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I do appreciate it. Yep. Thank you very much you for bet. your time. Thank you. All right. Can you, can you show me where his property is again? Big square. The, big square. The, this, is, this, this is the uh, annex, portion we're annexing right now. This portion here is already in the city. Which one is in the city? All of this mm -hmm. around here is already in the all city. All of this is in the And this is his 40 acres right up here. Okay. According to this, he this shows him being in the city, but he's in the county right now. His, his, this, this portion, I believe, I believe you are in the city. city. Yeah. Okay. Um, but again, this is the enclave right now. You know, we have everything else is basically mm -hmm. in the city. But um, point to the white map. And his access is right up yeah, there. Yeah, go to the white map, Jim. Go to the left. Still the, it's easier to see. Right easier to see. Oh. On the, there you go. Yeah. That's his property. This is his property, yes, yeah, 40 acres. And it's in this city? Yes. Okay. And there's a currently a home there? Because uh, I couldn't tell about the picture. It's a nursery. A nursery? Yep. And this is this is all part of the uh, the Bron uh, Bronson property. You know, they've got uh, yeah. three hundred acres. Yeah, it's a, it's uh, one hundred and fifty acres. Yeah. And, and that right of way is the only access to that piece of property. Well, in the it, back? it's an easement. It's not an actual right of way. Um, it's a little bit of a different and a right of way is actual dedicated um, roadway. It might but it might be paved. It might not be paved. Um, easement allows them, it's usually an access easement to, for them to get to their property. Right, so that's my question. That's the only access he has? As far as I know, yes. Is that the only access that you have to your property? Okay. And anything that occurs with this development, um, he'll, and he'll, he'll have probably to end up getting a paved access. Right, right. You'll, you'll, you'll end up with better access. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they, they, they can't take the access away from, yeah. away right. from him. Awesome. Thank you. Allison, could you have answered that? <laughs> All right. Well, she's been a great member. You know, she came to us from a, a regional planning council, and she's been a, a fresh addition to our, our team. So we're, we're glad to have her on board and always tease her a little bit. She's the, the new girl on, on the block. But Okay. Anybody else from the public wish to speak on this matter? Not will close the public hearing. Look for a motion to approve ordinance number 2812 at first reading and hold over for second reading and adoption. So moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Becker. Second. Second by Commissioner Velasquez. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Next up, resolution 2021-01. So the first of the new year is Jamie Roberson. Resolution number 2020-01. Resolution of the City Council of the City of Apopka, Florida, amending the budget for the fiscal year beginning October 1, 2020, and ending September 30th, 2021, providing for a budget amendment. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Jamie Roberson, Finance Director. 
The budget amendment before you has several items that we are presenting. The first item is the presentation of the air packs as Chief Wylam presented. So we have 134,000 approximately coming from general from the revenue from the supplemental compensation as well as $51,697 coming from the general fund reserves for a total amendment of 186,564. Then the second item on the budget amendment is the funding for the Golden Gem Project. Many of you are fully aware of the pond that we were digging out at in the Northwest Rec area for that big pond out there. So we have a bid actually out on the street that will be closing soon. So this is the budget amendment to fund it. A portion of it is coming from the 403, which is the utility impact fee fund reserves and from the dirt sale proceeds that we've collected over the years for the dredging of that um, area. The third item on there is for the amendment for one of the transportation um, projects for US 441 and Bradshaw Road, the intersection improvement there. It was not included in the fiscal year 2021 budget. The funding source is the transportation impact fee fund reserves. Um, this is a project that it's we are in dire need to complete. And the last item there is a budget amendment for the repairs associated with the damage to the public services building that Mr. Crisofulli referenced earlier, that storm that hit, I believe it was in early August, um, with all the damage we received, insurance proceeds over last fiscal year and this fiscal year. So there we are taking the $10,000 from the insurance proceeds from the reserves in fiscal year 20 that we received and recognizing the insurance proceeds that we received this fiscal year in the amount of 11,000, <coughs> approximately 11,784 for total amendment of $21,784. Okay, any questions for Jamie? Okay. Why did you leave? <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll look for a motion to approve uh, resolution 2021-01. So Second. moved. Got a motion by Commissioner Smith. <laughs> Second. Second. Second by Commissioner Becker. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Mayor, may I say sure, absolutely. kind words? Yeah. I wanted to address each and every one of you. It's been a pleasure working <clears throat> with every one of you. Um, I'm thankful and grateful for the opportunity that Edward and Mayor have given me over the last two and a half years. I appreciate and hope I've been impactful to the, the impact to the city to make it better and get you guys on the right path. Again, I appreciate everything you have done for me. And I was actually sworn in yesterday as a clerk deputy at the swearing in for the new clerk. So I'm looking forward to my new endeavors and opportunities in the Osceola County Clerk's office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we couldn't have done it without you. It was, uh, yeah, we, we, were, uh, we were destined to be together for a couple of years for sure. And you got us yeah. through the, the darkest part of the budgeting and finance, financial issues that we were facing. So we couldn't have done it without you. So, Jamie, you will sorely be missed. So thank, thank you. you guys. Absolutely. Okay, City Council report. Commissioner Velasquez, want to start us out? Um, first, I just I want to thank uh, Eddie Bass because I kept him really busy. <laughs> I had a list of concerns. Um, obviously, uh, with my win, there were a lot of phone calls with different concerns in our community, and um, and I gave him a long list, and he addressed each and every one of them, and actually. Uh, some of the issues were resolved, so I just want to say thank you, uh, and thank you to the staff for, uh, you know, addressing some of that. And also, I want to thank Chief Wyland, is he here, um, certainly for reaching out to the Boy Scout, because, um, as you know, I had gotten a few phone calls with that. So, uh, just wanted to say thank you, and, and that's important when the... Uh, you know, the residents call and, you know, for them, whatever the issue is, is the most important thing. And um, so I go out and I'm, I speak on their behalf and try to resolve the issue. And I'm really thankful that when I do contact our staff and I do it through Eddie Bass, um, uh, that it gets resolved. So I appreciate that. So uh, my first two weeks were very busy. Good. Thank you. Awesome. 
Mr. Blankson. Uh, again, just want to say thank you to Jamie. You really did uh, come at a very important time, and you've been a pleasure to work with, and, and we all wish you well and hate seeing you go. But uh, um, just to kind of follow up, of course, we have our new signal at Martin and Vic, which is yes. wonderful. The <laughs> um, only thing there, I'm not sure if there's an ability. I noticed there and still at um, uh, Park and Summit, the left turn lanes, sometimes they sit there, and there's no cars there to trigger it, but it still turns, so it holds the traffic. On those two intersections, if we could look at that, I think that would help. I, yeah, um, I think we're still looking at that. Okay, they're yeah, it's, I know it's new, so they're tweaking. So I know they're tweaking this morning. They're still working on it. Um, so yeah, there's still some tweaks to be done. Okay. But the same at uh, at uh, Park and Summit there, right in front of the schools. It, it's still, you know, when no one's there, it still will hold it red. Okay. So. Um, it came from the Chamber of Commerce meeting today, a special meeting, of course. We have many people going to bigger and, and uh, you know, more yeah. challenging right. positions. And, uh, of course, Robert is doing that. He's done a tremendous job. Uh, he left us in a very good situation, and we were in a net positive position, which was uh, very good for this season that we've been through, uh, gained in membership there. So that is strong. But the biggest reason that's important, of course, is his involvement in our economic development. And good report for that is uh, we are soon to see the website, which is kind of the, the central hub to see economic development come Correct. forward. Correct. And it's what we've been working on for quite a while now, that when someone comes to town, how can they say, this is what I want to do, how can I do it? It brings all the elements together. I'm very excited about that. And I think it's really going to help us in, yep. in all the economic development opportunity. Um, only other thing, and... Uh, you know, hate to have to bring it up, but the trees at McGee and Six have still not been trimmed. They look terrible. Those those palms. Okay, okay. I'll, and I I'll, know that's not ours. That's <coughs> that's on. I'll I'll make the call. There. Yeah, we we okay. need to get yeah, that yeah. because it's too the, beautiful of a yeah. an avenue to okay, let and, that go. And the rose bushes need some yeah. tension. Okay. Yep. I can take care of that. And happy New Year. Happy New Year, <laughs> Commissioner Smith. Well, let me say Happy New Year as well, and. Uh, uh, I guess I was hoping that our finance director was going to make a different comment than the one she made today. <laughs> uh, it's truly been a blessing to have her with her here in the city. Uh, she's made a great impact, and she's definitely going to be missed. But uh, I understand, and we wish you the best in your new endeavor. And we uh, are hopeful that, should we need your services, that we're able to rely upon you to assist us as we move forward. Uh, also just want to come in as well that the light at the high school uh, up and operating has been a bit uh, help and release some of the traffic that we have there at that area and so we're glad to see that operating and uh, if we can just get that public's turning lane fixed that would be a great help uh, <laughs> to leave it air traffic there to still individuals that don't recognize that that arrow says right turn only <laughs> so uh, that's going to be a help and with the uh, new year, some old things still carry over, so we're still waiting on our deputy chief of the police. <laughs> <clears throat> um, I think we'll have something for you in the near future. <laughs> Thank you. That's all I have. <laughs> Mr. Baker. Yeah, I'll just end with uh, thanks again, Jamie. Um, thanks for all that you did, all that you do, and good luck to you there in Osceola County. I know our front row visitor here doesn't care about Osceola County. He cares about Lake <laughs> County. That's a different world down there. Um, uh, but thank you. And you know, I sprinkled in some of my concern during the course of the meeting, but also to just to echo uh, Commissioner Smith. Um, you know, what is the plan to replace Jamie? Uh, you know, mm -hmm. posts that we still need to fill, HR director, those types of things. What's the strategy there? To Commissioner, we are um, now. I have to focus. Finance is very critical right now. Um, I will tell you, HR <clears throat> is moving in the right direction. We have reconciled a lot of items. We've brought a lot of things up to date. We've caught up on our orientations. We had things that we were behind on. We're caught up on our insurance bills. So, so HR is, is holding its own and doing a pretty good job. My goal right now is to get finance filled as quick as possible. That's critical, as you know, as we move into audit, finishing audit, we move into budget season. It's very, very critical. We've been advertising across the state. We've reached out to all of the organizations. Um, we've had a few applicants. I will, I'll share with you, I haven't had many, but I have had a few. Um, one of them is kind of promising, so we're going to reach out and, and um, make contact with, with that individual. But we are planning to hopefully, I hope to have really in the near future, <clears throat> as you know, in the interim, 
I will have to sit in that role. I, as you know, that used to be my role before I came into this role. So um, Jamie's done a good job. I, am, I'm, I hate to lose her. I tried everything to keep her. There's just no way, and I understand it's closer to her home, and it's the opportunity's a great opportunity. She's done a great job um, <clears throat> with what she's had to deal with. <clears throat> I've kind of asked her to help us out, too, if she knows of somebody that in her passings or whatever that might be a good fit for that position to kind of let us know. So um, definitely, we've already begun that. As soon as we get that kind of under our belt or whatever, then we will move to the HR position. So those are two, those are two critical points that we've got to work on um, getting um, filled as soon as possible. And, and I, wanna fo I wanna get the finance one as quick as I can, because as you know, we're right in the middle of the audit. And so, and she's, she's built a great team and I want her team to have good leadership. So, um, so that's the priority. Yeah, I mean, I mean, my only concern, I mean, it's, a, it's an existing and continuing concern is that having somebody in HR director spot when we're hiring director level positions, really any position for that matter, the hiring process is up to snuff in terms of HR policies, laws, state statutes, whatever. Um, absent having someone that's skilled and certified in that position on staff and we're hiring director level positions or other positions, again, me and, and a layperson's point of view, we have risk that's presented. So that, that's my thing. I just, I think having a sound person in the HR position is the top of the food chain versus a finance director, my opinion, but I just think that, that there's more risk in not having an HR director. Well, position. I think they're both critical. I think they're both very, very <laughs> important. Um, so, but um, I, agree, I agree with you, and so we're working on both of those positions. <clears throat> you have someone out, do you have a, uh, are you out right now uh, looking for an HR director? No, we have not, we have not, um, we were going to go that direction when Jamie announced her resignation, that was one of the areas where it is, um, that the finance director position is very, very critical um, because of where we are currently in the process when it comes to the audit, when it comes to the finance, we have, we're right in the middle of the audit and you've got the finance director that's leaving in the middle of the audit. So it's pretty critical that we get another director on board for that to move forward with the audit function. Again, and interviewing for a finance director um, at the end of the day, you know, falls on my shoulders. So um, it is one of those things that, you know, I will be working through that interview process, working through those applicants. I wanna tackle that first, because I, that is to me right now is the most critical, is making sure we get a talented individual in that position um, there are a lot of people looking for finance directors right now, so it's a tough road. So I have been really working hard trying to reach out to my colleagues and reach out to people that, so that I can make sure that we get the best um, leader for that team. <clears throat> so I think that's, that's critical just to focus on that, and then you will see the HR um, director position coming right with it, right in line with it, so. I'm, I'm sorry, so who is HR? Right now. Currently, Jeannie Green sits in as our HR manager, and I, and I um, want to tell you that I want to thank her. She has done a great job. Um, <clears throat> I, um, she's, what she's had to deal with has been, been um, there's been a lot of turnover in that position. There's been, I guess you know, we went out, we seeked a professional, we had some issues, um, we fell behind on a lot of things that weren't getting done. I will tell you that those things are caught up. Those things are, are, have gotten done. They're, they're um, where they need to be today. So the goal is, is to bring someone in. I wanted to make sure that we had those things caught up, those things in order before you bring someone new in to, um, to that situation. Um, I think it's only fair that if we're gonna bring somebody good in, that we at least have our house in order. It may not be perfect, but at least we have the stuff up to date and we have the things current. So, um, we got I, lucky with Jamie coming in, and she didn't know how bad it was. And we just don't right. want the HR director to come in in the same kind of position that, you know, there's such a mess that you know they they throw up their hands. And so I think I think it's imperative that we get get all of our ducks in a row, and then we then we hand over something that's 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 running, is functioning, versus something that we got another you know a bunch of things we've got to clean up. And so that's I think it's the right the right move. And um, and so we'll, we'll get there, you know, I, I would think before the end of the quarter, um, we'll have it in the, you know, 20, 2021 first quarter, maybe mid beginning of the second quarter or something like that. <clears throat> and let me point out, too, I want to make sure that you know, and I want to make sure the employees know, the employees have been taken care of. We are taking care of the employees. Jeannie's done a really good job. My door is open. If there's any kind of an issue, any other issue, 
we have not, I have not had any major issues. I haven't had any problems. I've, all I've heard is good things about how Jeannie has been able to help these employees that they didn't have been getting in the past. So um, again, and, and I reiterate that and say that to the employees, if the employees have issues or whatever, please, you know, if, if you're not getting what you need or whatever, please come see me, come see your director, come see me if you happen to have an HR issue. But I have heard a lot of nothing but good feedback from the employees that they're getting the information they need, things are getting organized, things are getting caught up, um, and then, um, so that's, that's, that's the most important part right now, is making sure that, that we are taking care of the employees until, like as Mayor said, we can get this, this um, position resolved. Was there anything else, Commissioner Becker, or was that, okay. Yeah, and I apologize, I did have one more thing. I, I was called yesterday, um, behind the Park Animal Hospital on Park up there in Sandpiper, that area, uh, there's apparently some people living in tents. There's been gunfire in the middle of the night, and there were some very concerned citizens. And they are in county, but they believe that the people are on city property. They're not sure, and I encourage them to you know, maybe check with Jim, see if he can and help line that out. But I don't know if we've heard anything about it. I have heard uh, gunfire in the night, and I, I live quite a ways further down. But, I uh, think it's on off of Usler. I think there's a somebody... I think there's a there's a gun range or something off of Usler where they've got berm and everything. So I don't think it's okay. Well, I, they had gone out there and seen the oh, people. Seen them? And okay, there okay. was alcohol involved. And they weren't mean, but uh, that's not a good combination. So, so Chief, can you take wanna, a take a look at that for us? Yeah, I, I, I can the, talk with you and show you where okay. I believe it to be. <coughs> okay, okay. Awesome. Uh, I've got the lady that called. I can give you that number as well. Okay, thank you. All right, Edward. Mayor, commissioners, um, first of all, let me say um, Happy New Year. Welcome to 2021. I hope it's a lot better than 2020. Um, <clears throat> I'm excited. I know the staff's excited. We're ready to start a new year. Um, we've accomplished a lot in 2020. We have a lot to go, as you know. We've talked about and, and a lot of things, but I think we're on the right track. We've got a great staff. Um, again, let me say that we're going to miss Jamie. She's done a remarkable job. Um, so, and I've told her that her job is one of the toughest jobs because I've done that job. So she had it had a pretty, pretty tough having to work with me, but all in all, she's done a great job. She'll do great for Osceola. They're getting the best. So anyway, um, let me give, uh, I want to give a quick update on the sales tax. As you can see in the report, we're down 26% again this month from the, from last year. Um, there's a continuing pattern here. We haven't seen much movement upward. Um, overall, on the right side, you can see that there's about a 4.6% reduction. That's if it's annualized. Keep in mind, sales tax numbers fluctuate from month to month. December's a good month, February a good month. It all just all depends. Of course, with COVID and everything, what we've got going on now, who knows what that trend is and where will we, <clears throat> when will we be back into that trend? But I think it's important that at least you know that we're down about four hundred and sixty-three thousand um, dollars, four hundred sixty-one thousand dollars from our budget on an annualized basis. So we'll continue to monitor this each month. I think it's important um, that we monitor this so that as we move through the budget, um, we can make changes or or we know where we're at and where we're going. So it's very very important. I think that that you keep this in mind um, as we move through. You know, budget cycles start again soon. So. Um, I think that's important. The other thing that I wanted to say real quick, if you recall our, um, our utility billing, our receivables, we were about 9% to uncollected. That was our aging report, that we were starting to go in the wrong, we go in a different, in the wrong direction. Um, again, COVID hit, we had to cut off, you know, we didn't cut off for services. You, as you know, that you approved um, to, to start, start those cutoffs again at the end of this last quarter and that we would do penalties starting January 1, as the council approved. I want to tell you that by, by doing that, we have gone from 8.9 down to about 2.7. So the, the receivables have come back in line. Again, keep in mind, we are helping our citizens. So if they need a payment plan, we're doing payment arrangements with our citizens to help them deal with, with everything that's going on in the economy. We've got about 200 payment arrangements currently with our citizens that we're monitoring and working through, but um, that's some positive news and some good news that 
we continue to work with, with all of our citizens when it comes to utility payments and their utility bills. But I wanted you to have that information because that is some positive information from the utility side. And that's all I've got. Thank you, Edward. Well, we haven't had to cut off anybody's services as a result of that, have we? Uh, as of our January 1st deadline? Um, we have, we've done cutoffs, but we've, we've, we've done a cutoff, it's because you haven't paid anything. Okay. You had so, to the payment right. plan. All right. And, and there was uh, a funding source, I believe, that was mentioned at the last council meeting that was the, the county, before as well? Yeah, the county has The county, right. yeah. Okay. And so we're hoping some of our citizens have taken advantage of that through the county. We have pushed that and tried to encourage that okay. to help them to, to, with their bills. All right. So, um, but yeah, we continue to work, Commissioner Smith, with all of our customers, and um, we're doing everything in our power to keep them on as long as we can keep them paying, you know, so. something. So. Well, I got uh, Representative True now here. We'll go back to that sales tax issue. And one of the, the big things for the League of Cities is kind of pushing is the they want to call it e-fairness. I don't want to call it e-fairness. I call it the Main Street Protection Act, which is, you know, all these little main, all of our little retailers on Main Street that are competing with, with you know, out-of-state uh, e-retailers. Uh, they're at that disadvantage, a 6% sales tax disadvantage. And so we sure wish, you know, the knowing it's the House side, we need help from the House to to bring that into, you know, <coughs> compliances that so all e-retailers all e pay their, their sales tax so that we can support our, our local retailers. We had a the, the guy that I've gone to for years and years and years that does my, fixes my watches, replaces all my batteries, has been in business for 40 years and is going out of business. And one of the reasons is because he can't compete. He says, you know, I got a thousand dollar diamond ring and 6% 60 bucks. If the guy in New York once, you know, has got an e-retailer, e he can, he can beat my price by 60 bucks. He says, how do I compete? So we sure hope you take a look at that and see if you can, I mean, it, it, obviously it's revenue for the state, revenue for the city, but that's not even, that's not really important to me. It's more important that we, we protect our, our retailers we have on Main Street. So whatever you can do to support us. Yes, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> Eric, can you go on because we yeah, have no a problem, dedicated no audience that's yeah, actually yeah. to I've been through local government before, and I just, I apologize. I should have remembered. Yeah. Uh, Eric Raimondo, Representative True Now's office. So, Mayor, just as you know, and the rest of the commission, it's something that the state legislature has been working on for some time. The representative was just commenting to me, commenting to me about looking into it to see if what's going to happen. I did hear there's some chatter and some talk again about it mm. um, because of the times that we're in and, right. and so the state as well as local governments are missing on that potential revenue as well. So yeah. and to try to keep some sort of fairness. Correct. Uh, yes, sir. It's protecting our our hometown heroes. So that's that's the way I sell it is it's, you know, you know, they, they, they create jobs. And, you know, if, if they're at a disadvantage and can't, you know, can't compete, then. We lose those jobs, and they go to New York or Chicago or wherever. We 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 might not ever get them back. So yeah, whatever whatever help you can give us would be awesome. Okay, well, Michael, can I, can I just make a, make sure. a statement? I mean, COVID has changed how how people are buying products, right? Because they're not going into these businesses. They're you know they still need you know for Christmas shopping, for Thanksgiving. They were all kind of forced to go on the internet and and buy stuff because a lot of the stores were closed and there were so many restrictions it didn't allow people to really shop the way that they shop because i i know what for me for sure i enjoy going to the shops and supporting the local businesses but when they're closed um i can't shop in their in their shop so you end up going into the internet so i think that as covid um uh, the vaccine helps us to start opening up some of our small businesses. I, I think a lot of people who were shopping online are really going to go back into their communities and support the stores right now. So, okay. thank you. Okay. All right, Michael. I'll say again, Happy New Year. And <laughs> on happier news, I have nothing to report. <laughs> okay. All right. Under the mayor's report here, got quite a few things. I mean, a lot of just you know, FYI information. Uh, the first one, though, is is something we need to know. Brian's here, you know, representing Parks and Rec. We here we are now, January um, sixth, and we we've got the 
you know, how do we open up Fran Carlton? How do we do, what, what do we do with the senior programs? And, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you. I, you know, I know that the vaccines are starting to roll out. We're not anywhere near where we need to be as far as even this, the over 65 crowd. Um, so we're looking for uh, Brian and his team, and I'm looking for some direction. Where how do you how do you want to handle? It? Do we open them up? Do we stay? You know, we kind of planned on being January, but you know, January's into December. January we've had a huge spike, and so I'm not sure maybe this is the right time. But um, so I'm looking for some direction as to you know where we go. My and I was giving my thought, and, and but. I'm not married to it is I, I would like to see us you know for any of the over 65 crowd is if we wait till we've got if you've got a vaccination which according to Michael we can we can uh, require that we let them come back as you know um, with or without mask if they think it's important to have mask but I think until we get to that to the uh, the vaccinations for over 65 crowd I'm I'm not real comfortable putting together in a room you know, especially because I think, as I see it, as you've got, you know, like the Frank Carlton, you've got, you know, the chair exercises. As much as it is, you know, keeping their balance and learning how to, you know, to, to you know, to work their, the muscles, it's as much about their interaction with the, the person next to them. And with mask on, I just, it's, it's hard, if they're already somewhat hard of hearing, to be able to hold a conversation, which I think, if you ask most of them, it's, it's, it's the camaraderie, it's the, you know, it's the, you know, the, the getting together as much as it is that, you know, the chair exercise itself. So, you know, so if we take the mask off, do we, you know, do we open ourselves up? And so my thought is as soon as they've got vaccinations, maybe we, we look at maybe rolling it to November 1st, I mean, excuse me, February 1st, because <coughs> um, I think we should, I think the vaccine should be rolling out in a, in a big, a big, big, big way here in the next couple of weeks for that, that crowd. And then, Starting February first, that we we start up, but I am open for Commissioner Smith, who's our our eldest statesman. <laughs> <laughs> How do we know that they've been vaccinated? They don't give well, you a card. We just have to ask them. I mean, just okay. I mean, there have been evidence that they asked those questions when you were in fly. They found out that people have not been truthful when they've asked the question. So how do we know that they've actually been vaccinated? I guess we, that we'll we get a card. Okay, Chief says we can get a card. They get a card. They do? Yeah. Okay. Everyone who gets a vaccine gets a card that they've been vaccinated. Yeah, come on up, Chief. They've been posting it on Facebook. Um, Sean Wyland, Fire Chief. Um, yeah, every, everyone who gets a vaccination, you, there's actually two separate shots you get for each vaccination. The, M the Moderna and the Pfizer, which are the most popular ones going around right now, Orange County's uh, uh, using Moderna. So when you get your first vaccination, you actually get a card that goes with you the date you got it and everything. And then when you go for your second one, which has to be anywhere from 25 to 30 days later, you get your another card that proves that. And counsel say that we can request to see the card. Yes. Oh. Uh, yes. Right. It's, it's, it would be as, as similar to, I want to confirm, but it would be similar to seeking proof of vaccination for um, registration in schools. So, and I know that the airlines are going to, some of the airlines mm -hmm. for international travel are going to um, use vaccination records to create what is basically a vaccination passport Database. for you to be able to travel um, internationally as well. And everybody in front of you is there's a should be a sheet uh, from Cindy Edwards. It's got the Saturday sound on the bottom. It kind of gives what, you know, what everybody else is doing. Mr. Well, Becker. Yeah, I mean, I guess the most simplest or question to ask is, is there a bunch of demand for it? I mean, are people knocking on the door right. saying, hey, right. give me my program back? Because if not, then we're just, you know. Short answer, yes. <laughs> like, like, quanti like quantify it. Um, well, like I how have, many people are in like a typical class and then are you expecting 100% participation? I wouldn't what we expect typically 100% had? participation. Now we're in the snowbird season, so our classes would typically be bigger. But yeah, I have, I have a message into me from the beginning of the week that called me last month. They said, check back with me beginning of January. And then I said, well, we're discussing it on Wednesday. And I'm expecting her to call me first thing tomorrow morning. So 
I mean, we, uh, could we really survey, Brian? Could we survey maybe like the the uh, the chair exercise <coughs> folks and the uh, we Zuma can, folks? I mean, we can. I know that there has been, there is interest. There is significant interest. Right. In so, so if there's significant interest, let's right. just do it in the safest manner possible. Right. Uh, per CDC guidelines. Per if we want to do the whole vaccination documentation, I'm I'm for that. Here's the, here's the one of the problems. Like with Zumba, we've got the over 65 crowd, which will be eligible for vaccinations. They are now. Mm -hmm. And the under 65 are not. So do you allow them to show up without the vaccination? Because they might be, who knows, May or June. Who knows when they're, do we let them in without a vaccination? So, so yeah, I, I mean, mean it's, it's, it's trying a, to make it as safe as possible for everybody involved. I, you know, requiring vaccination as a blanket requirement, even though we know that vaccinations are only being provided to 65 and up, that doesn't put us in a position where we're, violating the rights right. of a certain class, right? I mean, okay. it, that's just a requirement that we have is that you have to have vaccination. Okay. Uh, no, that's that a question. Shouldn't be a, it shouldn't be a concern about violating somebody's rights. Now, if we right. want to tailor the program to those that are have vaccinations, it could be one way, but if there's no need for proof of vaccination, then we pursue it to CDC guidelines, restrict attendance, have social distancing. And if that's one way of accommodating the program that is that is one route in addition to making all participants um, enter into COVID waivers as well. Yeah, because what I don't want to be is, you know, listed fifth on this list right underneath Deltona. Deltona is basically saying, hey, we've got a capacity of 500. We follow the state guidelines, but really we don't require a mask. It's just kind of no cap on attendance. It's just, you know, willy nilly. It kind of seems. Let like. me give you just an example. We just we just I know Cindy. We had an event. Was it a wedding? wedding at, at Fran Carlton, mm -hmm. they were going to have over 100, right at 100 people. So I, ugh, I didn't feel good about that. So what we did, we said, listen, we'll give you the Fran Carlton for the same price. Yeah, VFW, so that you can, yeah. Huh? yeah, we sent them over to the VFW for the same price. Right. right. So we just, that way we're able to spread out the 100. 100 in, at Fran Carlton would be a fairly tight, <coughs> um, you know, event. So we're, we're trying to accommodate where we can with, you know, and, and obviously keeping you know, safety at the, at the, at the top of our, of our list. But I mean, did, did you have a recommendation that you wanted to give to us to say, Hey, you as director, what, what do you, what do you want? Um, I want us to be as safe as possible. What, um, why don't we do this? Let uh, just, let's get everybody's kind of comments. And then Brian, we'll, we'll get together in between now and next commission meeting. I, I think with, with February one, because I think we're, we're not going to have enough vaccinations, even if that, if that's what we, we wanted before February, February one. So let's, so we have our first commission meetings February 3rd, 3rd. So why don't we get the team together? Let's kind of come up with a, some recommendations, bring it to the council next meeting, okay. and then we'll we'll move forward that. We'll have a couple of weeks to see, supposedly according to the chief, the, the, the vaccines are starting to roll. And so I think mm -hmm. we'll have a, a, a better handle on where mm -hmm. the vaccinations are in a couple of weeks. Okay. Is that, is that good? Okay, Commissioner Banks, any, anything? Mr. Nope. Okay. I'm fine. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate that. Okay. Next up, Rock Springs Ridge. Just want to let you know they've got a uh, um, their community meeting for those um, that live in Rock Springs Ridge, January 12th. Uh, they're going to be using the amphitheater, mm -hmm. uh, 6 o'clock. So that's for residents of Rock Springs Ridge, January 12th, 6 o'clock p.m. at the amphitheater. Now, is there any restriction of us, of us attending in that? The notice that was posted said no elected officials. Okay, but I did there. No, there's, there's no restriction, even mm -hmm. if all five of you decide to attend, as long as none of you speak as to matters that are pertaining, that, or that could be potentially before you as, as a voting matter. Sure. Okay. All right, but if we're, like Alexander Smith and myself, we're residents. Well, it doesn't matter either way. Doesn't matter. So you could, you could be there as long as yeah. the two of you don't dis, don't speak to. I mean, the easiest way is just don't speak to each other. Okay. Or don't speak at all, really, because yeah. right. you, you and, correct and don't yes. and and um, don't speak as to a matter just because it's a it may come up as a matter that could be it um, will <laughs> well it will be coming up as a matter that we voted up against. Yeah. But there's no restriction as to you attending. Okay. Okay, next up, uh, Wekava River 
walk complex. I just I got a map here. We're we're trying to work with the folks um, uh, at Woolbright to you know they they had a couple of grocery tenants that were about ready to pull the trigger on that that new the new uh, uh, area closest to uh, Piedmont Wicava and and then when the the uh, the they blocked that turn lane into the center it. Scared two two potential tenants off from that that spot. So, what we're doing is this: we've got some some. Uh, Pam's been working with them to try to come up with a way that we can get we can get two way access from the the would be the north side of the complex versus the single single path. I think there's a chance we can you know they that would give them enough comfort to uh, for these tenants maybe to take a second look at it. There's some additional small problems, but. You know, they'll have to put in a stem wall. There's a, there's kind of a drop off that they're going to have to to work with, but I think they're willing to put in you know a few few extra dollars to to make that a, a viable option for a, you know a major you know retailer. So hopefully we'll be able to you know help them you know, get that available ready ready for for rent. Um, next up, FDOT. There's a public hearing on uh, 441. Uh, it's between Central and Bradshaw. So they're doing a lot of work there. That's going to make that area which has always not been known as the safest part of a popkin so we're looking to try to make some safety improvements as long as, and th this is just the, the the planning and then probably what two, 22 will be the the actual right it'll do all the Right, so it should be some major improvements in that that stretch of 441. So anyway, the the public hearing is on February 2nd uh, at 5:30 p.m. at the VFW. So anybody that wants to find out about the, the improvements there between Central and Bradshaw on 441. Next up, um, CFX. They're having a public hearing on road widening of 429. From Apopka back over toward uh, Winter Garden, so uh, that will be on January 27th, uh, 6:30 p.m. It'll be a virtual meeting. If you've got any questions, how to get to that virtual meeting, you can let us know. We'll get you the, the details. One of the things I'll, I'll let you know I'm going to be asking for is, you know, we when they they put in the 414, one of the things they did is they had the off ramp uh, onto off of 4, 414 at kind of near Binion. And not near Benyon, near near uh, um, Martin. Martin. And so we want to, you know, hey, can we go ahead and get an on ramp? So one of the things we'll be asking, it's not really what is in this the scope, but I, at least we, you know, if we don't ask, we'll we'll never get it. So we'd like to be able to to have, you know, on and off access on on the 414, which obviously gets you to the 429 and and all the way around, you know, the the, the greater Central Florida area. Okay. Uh, Next up, uh, COVID numbers. You got the COVID numbers, but I tell you, what's kind of kind of exciting. Not that's, the COVID numbers are not exciting, but one of the things that's uh, had a great conversation with Danny Banks, who's who's the emergency management uh, operations for Orange County, and uh, he he's runs the program now that it's at the the convention center where they're doing the vaccinations. And he said um, he said, listen, we would love to be able to to spread out. And go to smaller communities and do the vaccinations. He said, "We're just not quite there yet. We don't have enough vaccinations to to spread them around." But he said, "You know, we would love to come to a popkin." And I said, "Well, just want you to send us over one of your your freezers, and we'll set it up, and, and away we go." He says, "Oh no, 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 no. This is a lot more. Yeah, this is the federal government coming in and and vaccinations. I mean, this like armed guards. It's 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 a whole nother level of security that I didn't know." was required but he did say what well, what you know in the next two weeks he thinks we'll have enough vaccinations coming into Orange County that what they would do is they would send out 200 vaccinations to Apopka every day mm -hmm. so we wouldn't have to store them we would just we would just do the vaccinations and so I was was checking with the chief and with Will Sanchez and uh, by the end of the week we'll have 20 of our paramedics will be certified by DOH to, to give the vaccinations so as soon as Orange County's ready, they've got the vaccinations that, that they, they can spread around, we should be first up. And, and what's 
what's kind of neat about this is this all came about because, you, you know, remember a couple years ago we had the, uh, the hepatitis scare and our fire department stepped up and did a lot of the vaccinations, especially for the homeless population we have here in the greater Apopka area. And so they knew how good we, we were, how good we could, you know, we could efficiently do this, 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 uh, these vaccinations. So they stepped up and said, yeah, uh, they even came out, DOH team came out to Apopka to get these guys certified. So we're excited. We're ready to go. Um, even had a call from Zellwood Station and said, hey, uh, let us know when you've got something like that. We'll, we'll, we'd love to come out and, and get vaccinated here at Apopka versus going down to Orange County Dominion Center. So um, great news. I mean, it just shows what, you know, how, how highly regarded our, our fire department is and that we're on the cutting edge of, you know, trying to, to make a difference here in the Central Florida area. Um, last but not least, uh, one, well, two, one, thank Robert Agrusa, you know, who's leaving us um, for bigger and better. You know, he's going to be the, the head of the Central Florida Hotel and Lodging Association. Will be a great partner there. So I think you know, th those those relationships will, will will stay for a long, long time. Uh, he did a lot of good things and, and committed to me, as I guess as to you, Commissioner Banks, and that, that the website will be up and running before he leaves. So we, you know, we're, we're looking forward to that. We also want to be engaged as they pick the next, um, you know, director because we, you know, that's a, that's an important position um, that we we need to be a, a great partner with them and them with us. So uh, we'll we'll keep you posted, uh, and I'm sure they will as to as they get narrowed down their their choices. We're we're excited and uh, for for what what the future holds for him and for what the future holds for the chamber and our our economic partnership. And then last up, uh, Jamie Roberson, I'll tell you, um, she came into this, <laughs> this position, and I, I know she thought there were a few issues, and, and I don't think Edward and I maybe, I don't know if we told any tales, but we might not have told her the whole truth as to what she might be facing. And uh, she came in, rolled up her sleeves, you know, took on a, you know, a big challenge, and uh, it really got us in the position where, you know, uh, she's going to be handing over a, a much better um, uh, finance department than, than when she came in. And uh, we, we really appreciate, you know, her, her hard work um, these two and a half years and, and, and know that we couldn't have done it without you. So, Jamie, hats off to you. So with that. Okay.